Good afternoon. I'm Sharon Hill, Director of Arts and Education at the North Carolina Arts Council, and I would like to welcome you to our second session of Teaching Artist Tuesdays. We're calling this session Your Services in the New Normal. In the last session, Eric Booth framed the context and challenges of the teaching artist field. If you missed that session, you can find recordings of the webinar on our webpage, Facebook page, and on YouTube. During this session, experienced teaching artists will begin to give you resources and tools to build and adapt your practice. Our goal for this session and the ones to follow is to provide tools and guide you so that you can have success no matter what's going on in the world around you. As we move along today, please use the question and answer box on Zoom or the comment box on Facebook to enter your questions and comments. In addition, please be sure to fill out the post session survey so that we can continue to develop sessions that best serve your needs. At this time, I'd like to introduce my colleague and partner in this endeavor, Lenora Helm Hammonds. Lenora? Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Sharon. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Lenora Helm Hammonds. I'm very excited to be with you today from the North Carolina Central University's Teaching Artists Certificate Program and really happy that we're in collaboration with the North Carolina Arts Council. Welcome to our second conversation here at Teaching Artists Tuesdays. And we really want to just start by taking the temperature in the room and learning how everyone is doing. So we're going to have a poll for you and we're going to ask you a couple of questions. Hopefully you can see this if you're in Zoom. If not, if you're on Facebook, just please type in your answers. I'm waiting this, okay, how would you best describe your current state of mind? I'm waiting this out so I can go back to normal. I, now, I know I need to change my practices and approaches, but haven't taken action. I'm actively seeking and learning about new approaches and practices. And lastly, I have implemented new approaches and technology in my practice. Choose one of those. Excellent. So we'll come back to those um, poll results a little bit later. And so without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our special guests. Today we have and we'll have help to explore new approaches from writer, arts entrepreneur, and musician Kim Arrington, mime and longtime teaching artist Jeff Lambden, and dancer, choreographer, artistic director of Black Box Dance Theater, Michelle Pearson. So Kim, We'd like you to start off our uh, conversation today. If you would, please, sure. what do you think about our current climate the past couple of months? What practices have you been working on? Well, what's hey, been working for you? Hey, everybody. Y'all say hey in the chat. I want to make sure y'all are live out there. I don't see anybody say anything. Um, good to see you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me, North Carolina Arts Council. Um, so, what I have been, hey Sherry, I see all the haze are coming in. That's right. Hey everybody, what's going on? See, I knew y'all were out here alive. Okay. So what I've been doing is um, decided, you know, a year ago, I realized I've been a teaching artist for over 15 years. And I realized there were some things that I needed to pivot. I needed to get into a new space. Um, I've worked with over a hundred thousand teachers, children, K through seven, um, all different types of communities. And I was ready for a change. I see Durham and Asheville's in the house. What's up y'all. Um, and so what I decided to do was think about how I could bring my practice online and reach people no matter where they were in the world. Um, they could have the ability to access it when they wanted to. And then I was like, I, in 2017, I was listening to artists complain yet again, how are they going to make the money? How are they going to do the things? This is all pre pandemic. Right. And I was like, 
I don't have that experience. I have a really healthy, happy, predictable business. And so I started getting this in my head, like, oh, maybe I can show artists what I've done. So if y'all will bear with me, I'd like to share some of what I've done, some of what I believe will help artists to um, be able to have, you know, the careers they want. So give me one second, y'all. All right. So I put together a little slide show for you to show you what you can do um, and how to make, you know, that work for you. So let me back on up a little bit. Okay. So I'm all about business and how, you know, so many artists feel like business is a dirty word. And for me, I know that when I have a business that's happy, healthy, predictable, then I'm able to have time to create more art, you know, take a vacation, have money in my bank account, help others, all those things. So I want to share with you how I think you can get back to that new normal. So the first thing is we have to get over this whole idea that perfect is the way to do it. You've got to just get out there and try a couple of things, be willing to fail, be willing to fail a lot until you find out what works for you. So please keep this in your mind. Perfect is so damn boring. We're artists. We're the ones who reflect society back to itself. And we've got to be willing to get out there and try some new things to make them happen. So I told you all I pivoted and pivoted. Pivoting is the word that should be like the word of the year, right? Um, other than mask, right? Mask and pivot. So you've got to figure out how to go in a different direction than what you've gone. And the way that I know that artists can do that is to teach what they are doing online. The Zoom boom is here, y'all. Grandma's on Zoom. Your um, cousin's on Zoom. Your aunt, your uncle, everybody's on Zoom. So people are looking to connect on Zoom. We're in our homes, uh, you know, and we need to realize that the screens that we're behind actually can be a way for us to increase intimacy and not keep us disconnected. So teaching online. And so one of the things, I, I see a couple of mistakes that artists make. And one of the things they do is when they think about now, they want to discount their prices. Do not discount your prices. This is not the time to do that. I want you to think about people are foregoing vacations. They're not spending money like they used to because, I mean, everybody's at the grocery store. You're spending money at the grocery store. But they're, you're, there are people who... Um, like, for instance, if you are teaching artists, parents aren't putting a lot of their kids in summer camps, you know, or think about other communities that are virtually ignored, you know, women 55 and older, all these communities who are now willing to take that dance class or take that acting class or take that writing class. And they want you to teach them, not as an instructor, but to coach them through a process that helps them see who they are in their life. But the way you do that is not pricing per class or pricing per hour. You're going to learn how to price for the value. You're giving people this new incredible experience and they are going to be willing to pay you for that. So that's one of the things that I really like to share with artists. Do not cut your prices. As a matter of fact, I recommend you creating packages so people can experience more of what you have to offer versus less. The other thing, I have these three secrets. I thought about how I had created a six-figure art business and um, came up with these secrets, right, um, that artists should do. So artists should have an offer. And the offer is basically what you are giving. Remember, you are giving a special part of your artistry or you're helping people to experience a new part of themselves. So what you sell is your offer, whether it is your, um, you know, mosaic or whether it is your, your storyteller, whatever you're selling, you're helping to teach people how to do 
somewhat, you know, what do you do? So you're going to have an offer that your customers cannot resist. And then you're going to create new buy-in opportunities for your past customers. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, your past customers, because it's so important. And then you're going to attract your new customers on autopilot. So you're going to think about, do you have a newsletter? I know most of y'all are not sending email to people who've already bought from you. I'm going to show you a stat that is going to make you want to reach out to those people who have bought to you because it is easier to reach out to a new customer versus an older, um, I'm sorry, a past customer versus one who's new. And then you want to have a way to keep getting new customers into what you're doing. Maybe it's social media. Maybe you offer a free 30 minute class to, you know, online, but you find a way to bring people into what you're doing. And then you need to have kind of a system to follow, a way that gets you to success. And that means that you find someone who's done it in a way that you like, or you find um, a program that helps to build these new skills in. And I wanna tell you about an opportunity that I have coming up in August that's absolutely free. So here is that stat. Past customers are 10 to 14 times more likely to buy from you than new customers. And I know so many artists are always like, I don't want to go back. I don't want to seem greedy or desperate or needy, all those words. But your past customers are delighted to come back and help to support you, whether you have an art product or an art service. And so... I talked about that last thing where you want to have someone to help get you into the process. And so what I do in my Facebook community, um, free Facebook community, is I come on for five days, coach, help you think about how to bring your art, you know, no matter what art form you do, online and how to turn it into an online business. There are 7.3 billion people in this world. You don't need all those people. 30 people to 25 people could change your life, could help you to be able to reach out with your art form and to create an online business. And then remember, we have the time now, right? The pandemic has gifted many of us with the time to be able to create art, write that book, do all those things. So what I wanna do is teach you how to do that. So it's for visual, performing, literary, and healing artists. It's gonna be in August. And the link is down there. And also we will put the link in the chat. So um, basically, this is the time. I know many of us lost contracts, we lost work. But when you're on in the online space, you can be working. I have um, clients I work with in New Mexico, in Oregon, in New York, in D.C., and I'm sitting here in Durham, North Carolina, you know, and so that's what I want to teach you is to find a different way to reach the people who want to be your people. All right. Any questions in the chat? I think that is just phenomenal, Kim. I um, am recalling what Eric Booth said to us, and it's in his music, um, it's in his uh, industry Bible. Wait, where is it? Right here. Oh, on his uh, uh, um, teaching artist Bible, that you have to be entrepreneurial or die. Um, and a lot of teaching artists feel sometimes like, oh, I can't do that. It's kind of, you know, I'm uneasy about that. It feels like creepy. But we're in a new normal, and I love how you explained how you've shifted. Um, is there anyone else, as we're looking for questions in the chat, is there anyone else on the panel who wants to respond to that? Or Sharon, do you have anything you want to add to that? Sorry, need to unmute. <laughs> Let's go on to another artist and see if we have some various ideas on how to address things in this new normal and we might get some comparisons going and Kim I love how you've taken you're an artist but you've taken those skills and kind of made a little you know jump over to being a trainer a teacher yes. um, and that will support your art making as well absolutely yeah Michelle how about you sure hi um, 
Kim, 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 thank you. Woo, I can't wait. I'm, I'm there in August. Um, I have like five little notes over here and I have ideas that I'm gonna pursue. So this, I'm so excited to be here. Okay, I will start with that. And now I'll move to, I'm, I'm the opposite of Kim. <laughs> I have prided myself on, um, I have prided myself on a very light footprint, you know, on this earth and have not worried about, you know, video and documenting and that kind of stuff. You know, Merce Cunningham talked about, you know, how dance is fleeting. It exists only in this single moment where we feel alive. And I kind of bought into that for 25 years. So um, this kind of radically hit black box. And we were like, what do we do when so much of the meaning and relevance of our work happened in the moment with real people in a human space? So um, I, can, I can share, let me share my little screen with you. Let me find, oh, where are my little, oh, it's not coming up. I wanted to share the, oh, here we go. Uh, I, can, I guess I can just share my desktop. Here we are. Can you guys see this? Can you see? I can't hear anybody. Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, I went back to the drawing board and, and we did it black box. We just kind of started with some of these quotes that we needed for ourselves <laughs> to remind ourselves that what, what we do has to be done. You know, so it was kind of a pull your bootstraps up kind of thing of... I, I did a gut check of, okay, I don't have the option of sitting this out if I truly believe that dance is essential in the world. And um, so that was kind of where we started. And then I will say, uh, Black Box, we decided to kind of look into, so what do we have? What do we have? You know, I talked about, we had very little uh, outside of the live venue, but actually we didn't. We started inventorying our photos, our videos that we did have, it, you know, kind of off from different places, lesson plans, and really relationships. And Kim, this is where she was talking about going back to, to who, you, who you've been in business with. So who were the relationships we had? Um, the other thing that COVID, I don't want to say forced us to do, it invited us to remember what we love most about our work. And that's where we wanted to start. So we didn't want to reinvent anything. We just wanted to reimagine, repurpose, and recommit to um, what we valued most and bring it forward in this moment. So, um, you know, I love this. Use your staff. What staff, you say? You're a non-for-profit little teaching artist with no staff. Well, yes, you do. You have a lovely staff. You have the North Carolina Arts Council. You have the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. You have A plus schools. You have your local arts councils who are your booking agents. And you have wonderful resources online. So we did, we tapped in. We were like, Sandra, can you give us a tutorial on video e editing? And, <laughs> and different folks totally met us in the moment. And so, so thankful for that. So um, just quickly, it's like, if I could show you kind of what, like this is like day one of a five day residency might look like in a school and how did we, you know, take this energy online? Just for a second. lessons we had all of these processes we had all of this history of being live with people and um, we were actually right in the middle of a residency down in Wilmington in three different schools and um, 
so we quickly decided how can we take the best of what we have and match it with what we love most about our own work and still offer that because we really weren't interested in anything else in anything short of what we loved so um this screen here kind of shows what we did we started doing crazy things like first of all down in wilmington they were dancing so we decided to kind of zoom bomb one of their classes and the teacher of course loved that this goes back to our relationships that we had making sure we stayed in touch with our, our um, colleagues and our relationships then we started just making a whole bunch of videos uh, and we said let's get on zoom and let's what we loved most about our work was the relationships the conversation the making of new material so we thought if we could do that together on zoom the kids could see the process we weren't talking or putting anything on them they were witnessing the making of it and i can show you a little bit this is us finished the kids had already learned that so you kind of see like all right so we're going to take these words and these laws and this science we're going to put some music to it and we have a dance <laughs> I'll stop it in a second. All right, so I'm stopping it. You get it. You get that exactly what Kim said, we learned firsthand. Perfect is not perfection. It's not. People don't want it. They wanted real people. They wanted real connections. So we took our program, we kind of made this, all we did was record Zoom. You know, there was very little production value and uh, the, t the teachers really connected. But what I love most about it was this, that um, we started to find these silver linings. We got excited about our old work in a new way. Well, um, we started crafting these little Zoom things where we're kind of looking around at each other and, and trying to interact through the screen. And, and it became really fun. We started pulling in props and having a great time. But another silver lining that we noticed that we could offer, because we kept focusing on what we lost by being online. And we thought, well, what, what can we offer that we couldn't do in a classroom? And um, one, you know, we, we had the words written out so people could see the visual and dance we took these things outside but then we started finding ways to have a recording and like kim said this now became available to anyone anywhere not limited to our availability to be in their school on a particular day it became accessible to people um, geographically and then we really wanted that elicit things where we got their input so they created the dances so we gave an assignment around force and motion you know once they learn the laws and the science we just asked so geez have you ever been stuck have you ever needed an outside force to get you unstuck from a situation have you ever been going full force and you just were stopped, like by COVID-19? Um, and the kids drew pictures and they wrote stories and they sent them to us through their teachers via email. And we made a new video and gave them the honor as the creators, the makers of these dance. And we gave them credit for you know, that. So we found a way to, um, you know expand geographically but also hold on to what we loved most which was we elicited their responses and then brought our artistry to them here's another silver lining at the end of our whole unit um we got to do this eh, queremos saber quién fue esa fuerza externa que te ayudó a resolver ese problema de matemática o que simplemente te ayudó a salir del problema we got to translate into another language. <laughs> so another way that our work all of a sudden got to grow, it got to grow by geography, it got to grow to include uh, those um, who are, are English or Spanish speaking, particularly if they're in their home with their um, families there. 
So that was kind of what was new for us and exciting. And I think it's a model that we're going to pursue with the other lessons that we have and see if we can't continue to learn something new about our work, hold on to what we love the most and broaden who gets um, access to the work. So that's um, a little bit about what's new and working for us. Let me see if I had, uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, for, for, for now, that's where we are. And the great thing is, um, again, we, my skills were like this. They are growing. Our newer videos have a little more kind of wow, but that's just because we're having fun with it. Um, but it doesn't have to be perfect. And the feedback we're getting from the teachers and from the students themselves is that it's fun, it's engaging. And then if we can show up for them through a live Zoom bomb or something, it makes us real and we can say their names, we can honor their voices, and we can include them in the process of making art and hopefully stay relevant and present. So that's uh, where, where Black Box is. And we're hoping that now, instead of being able to do one residency a week, we can do 20. <laughs> Any Michelle, questions love, or thoughts? I love how you took, you know, what could have been a very negative, we've lost everything, we can't do this, we can't do that, and turned it around and approached it from a positive attitude of what what the new situation is offering. What are the new challenges and what are the new um, contexts that we can work in? And I think that's infectious. Your teachers, um, I was hearing a lot from her when the residency was interrupted. Uh, they are halfway through a residency and boom, COVID hits. And the, the, the feedback that I heard from the teachers in New Hanover County was over the moon that they were working so hard to try to serve the needs of those, those classrooms. So um, that's really important. And we heard this morning, a lot of people think that um, schools are really confused right now, and they are, but teachers are craving new material and they're craving material that aligns with their curriculum. So it's an opportunity. Yeah, they're really looking at new ways. I loved that you said, look at the silver lining opportunities because that's what get people's attention. And as artists, we've been working in the same way for so long, it's kind of a culture shock for everybody. And so those who go to the front of the line and go out there fearlessly, like you've done, that's what's going to be the new normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeff, you got some ideas for us? I know you've been trying some new things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Sharon and Lenora and Sandra, who's running the ship, and Wayne at the Arts Council. And I appreciate you all inviting me for being part of this effort to become a way to sustain our field of teaching artistry in North Carolina. Um, a lot of you know me. I'm the guy with the gray hair now, um, <laughs> but I've been a while around a while sharing mime and variety arts residencies. I make my living as a performer. And that makes me different from many teaching artists is my main um, stream of funding comes from work. And I, I perform every weekend uh, from March to October at fairs and festivals, which means this year I'm not performing. <laughs> so the teaching artist work I do is usually in the winter. And um, I, I teach mime, theater mask, Circus arts, comedia, del arte, melodrama, playwriting, creating, composing, devising, and arts integration. Um, all of my teaching artist work is booked six months to a year ahead of time. So I'm done with my booking. I'm booked for next year through May of 2021. Now, whether or not these residencies will actually happen and how they will be presented remains to be seen. It may be online, it may be virtual, and it may be partially live and, and not But if somebody goes to a flex schedule. The biggest challenge that I faced this year when booking things was something that Sharon mentioned a minute ago. Um, nobody knows what they're going to do. Uh, even today, with the current guidance from governors of all the states I work in, 
schools and school systems are still trying to figure out how to play in the new normal. I don't know if you guys heard, but the governor of South Carolina demanded yesterday that every school at least have some days where the kids go to school. Uh, so the governors are still trying to figure it out. The departments of public instruction are trying to figure it out. So what I decided was, yes, I can always do my work online. Um, and then I have to study filmmaking <laughs> a little more. But the world has changed. And so has being a teaching artist in that respect. Now, what, I, what I've done market-wise is when I was booking this year, not only did I send my regular materials and contact the people who sponsor me, the arts coordinators at the schools, I contacted their principals, I contacted the superintendents, I contact, contracted the arts coordinators in each of those districts. And I communicated to them um, that one, I'm ready to do the rigorous work that I usually do with their students, and two, that I am serious about keeping things safe. Now, um, Sandra, are you there? Can you put up slide number four? Maybe, yes. Yes, go to the fourth one. You can flick, yeah, that one right there. Okay. In order to learn how to adapt my teaching practice when I go live again and my marketing to reflect the focus of student safety, I completed the online business training course offered by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services called Count on Me NC. I encourage all of you to do the same thing. This certification, and this is my certificate, and I've got a little sticker that I can put on the window of my office, but I don't know how that's gonna work. Um, it has affected my teaching artist practice and my marketing. If you go to the next slide, Sandra. Thank you, all right. Now, by examining my teaching practice, I realized I had to make some changes. And to communicate these changes to my sponsors, I came up with these three key points, right? I wanted them to know that they can count on me to manage the healthy social distancing of students during my workshops. I wanted them to know that they can count on me to manage cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting of all surfaces and environments. And I wanted them to know that they can count on me to manage my health and health monitoring. When I was pitching my residencies to my sponsors, um, this attention to the topic of student safety during the new no normal was serious business. It let them know that I was gonna not only provide quality arts education, but they did not have to worry that the residencies wouldn't be safe. They would, that I could do it in a safe and healthy manner. And uh, can you go to the next one? These are some of the documents that I sent to the superintendents and the principals. Uh, uh, the one on the left is a detailed thing about all the changes I made in my teaching practice. Everything from realizing that when I teach circus arts, each child has to have their own equipment. Uh, they can't share anything. And at the end of the class, they, everything needs to be sanitized. And so I bought more equipment and I am going to pick up tomorrow all the sanitizing elements that I have ordered from my local provider. So anyway, that's the big thing that I've done um, is actually uh, communicated the new normal and how I fit into it to my sponsors. Sharon? Yeah, I love that. Um, one thing that just occurred to me, you know, you talked a lot about schools. And um, last session, Eric talked a lot about teaching artists aren't always just at schools, right? Right. Uh, we're working in lots of different types of community organizations. Um, and each of you has experience doing that. How do you see that communication differing when you're communicating with a possible partner or employer? who is not a school. Everybody's concerned with the same thing. When you get people together, we have to social distance. Mm -hmm. We have to keep things clean. And it doesn't matter if I'm working with a rec department. They are, they're thinking in the same ways. It doesn't matter if I'm working with an after school program or a community center. They are dealing with the same issues. 
Absolutely. Um, one thing too that we had a meeting this morning with the Department of Public Instruction, there will be some schools, not, probably not school systems, but there will be some schools and organizations that will have a limited type of opening. So one thing I would strongly suggest is that you reach out to organizations in your community and communicate with them so you know, are they doing all virtual? Are they accepting some people coming in? Some schools are saying no one will come in. And you need to know that. In your community, how do you best interact? And if, if I may, can I add some to that, Sharon? Of course. When, when if you look at all the guidelines in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, and Georgia, that the school systems have come up with. That's where I work. I work in all those states. Um, the, they all say that limit non-essential people from entering your building. And if we let them consider us non-essential, then we fall under that. However, when I contacted the superintendents in the systems where I work, I, I asked them if they were going to let substitute teachers come in. And they said, well, of course, because they have to keep the kids in cohorts. They can't mix them. They can't send six of them off to Miss Barry's class, eight of them off to somewhere else. They have to keep all of the kids together. So they have to get a substitute teacher. That's no different than me coming in. And once I spoke like that to the superintendents, then they started to understand that I was trying to change their mind. What is an essential worker? to make sure that teaching artists are considered in that mind. I love that because that goes right into one of the questions that we wanted the panelists to respond to and that's how do you help decision makers value teaching artists? And so you saying that I'm no different from a substitute teacher puts that information in their head, you know, because everyone's confused, they're scrambling, they're nervous. Every week we get a different um, prescription uh, of what we're going to do to address everything. That's really great. What do you think uh, on that, Michelle or Kim? So I think that we need to decide that the decision makers aren't just the school superintendents or administrative officials. I think right now, as we're considering this kind of new normal, the decision makers, I mean, in my opinion, um, an artist's ability to diversify. So yes, you're serving schools. Maybe you begin looking at servicing, you know, businesses because there are businesses that are still, whether they're virtual or not, they're looking for ways for their um, employees to connect, to build morale, to do all those things. So I think going out of what your sphere of, um, you know, being comfortable is and trying the new things and the other thing is for many teaching artists we get we really think about schools right but the people in your community also want to experience the brilliance you have to offer and they are decision makers as well of how they want to spend their dollars right and so before all this was happening to speak to michelle i was um i'm a multi-passionate artist i was thinking about doing a theater piece now I get to decide how to do a theater piece via online. Maybe I'm at a theater, maybe I'm online. You know, it isn't about being, a, you know, the, the best, you know, video maker or, or any of those things. It's about entertaining people, helping them to feel connected and helping them to, for a moment, forget that the world is this kind of crazy place that we don't know what's going to happen next. And those people, when they feel that way, when you're able to show them their vision, remember we're artists, we're, we're able to do that, communicate those things. We're able to show those that vision, then they're able to easily make a decision. I love how Jeff had that count on me with all, I mean, you know, he, he reached out and thought about what is on the minds of the decision makers, but also they want their kids to be entertained. There's a lot of, you know, trauma around and uncertainty around kids and, and families and all these things. And the arts are a way to deal with that, right? There's such a therapeutic aspect of the arts. So we're the, we're the ones who are going to bring about this change. We're the ones, right? I, I, 
I agree completely. And um, a few things I want to weigh in. One, you know, starting with this deep listening. And I consider, you know, when I talked about that extended staff that non-for-profits like me have to have, Jeff is, whether he knows it or not, is on my staff. He's on my R&D staff. And I just wanted to show y'all this real quick. Yay! <laughs> I saw that right away. And, you know, so of course, uh, Black Box went out and did that. And um, the other thing I want to talk about is Black Box schools are probably, you know, maybe, maybe half of the communities that we're in. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of work um, in various communities, uh, professional learning communities, and uh, with the military, active duty military down at uh, Camp Lejeune, Fort Bragg. And so that notion of um, what is essential is where I'm starting. What's essential for, for me as an artist? What's essential for the communities in which I enter? And so I love Jeff proposing that you go and you say, you know, only essential employees are allowed in the building, non-essential people excluded. Well, then we have to find a way of matching what we do to what others find essential. So I used my extended staff again in the morning, this call with Lenora and uh, Sharon. Here we had, uh, I love the DPI put out all of this content around you know, what the schools are looking at as essential around some of their, um, I know we've all been hearing around social emotional intelligence and, you know, uh, the castle system and stuff. And they are saying that this is essential. That is what I'm hearing. So now as an artist, how do I come in, give my count on me and see certification? It would be great if, you know, look, let me go back to this for a second at the bottom here, I don't know if we can screen and show it. We have NC State Extension, we have the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, we have the um, Visit NC, the Tourism Department. I would love for the North Carolina Arts Council possibly to, to jump on this too, to show this as a, um, an effort of credibility and um, accountability uh, you know, for the artists and a step that we are taking that could be honored and um, put forward. So when the schools do tell us, or the communities do tell us that social, emotional, learning experience are essential right now more so than ever, we can meet this moment in this way. Um, and lastly, um, again, with, with the military, it's we're we're having to adjust to them too i thought i had to make all these videos for them and they're like no we just they're okay i saw a lot of questions here about the zoom time and people are overloaded with zoom and i thought i am too no one therefore no one wants it i'm exhausted and it's so um i don't know removed and not exciting and flat and sad to me and then i hear from our military folk um it's essential they're isolated, they are overwhelmed, they are desperate for someone to provide a human uh, connection, to elicit their story, to hold their story, to craft it, to engage with them. And if it has to be through Zoom, so be it. So we're gonna have some of our warrior resets uh, going live uh, in August with them. And again, I'll take what I learned in the school of you know finding a way that they can still bring their participation and it is what we build everything on it's not a presentation it's a participation you know they bring their items their stories and we use it to craft in the moment so if it is live then it should be live you know um and we'll go from there but i so i think jeff i thank you i think all of you for I think this is where I am right now, and many of us, the more we can bring to each other, we, you know, I need a big, big staff <laughs> and all that we are learning and discovering um, we'll use in different ways, but in that use, it'll spark um, innovation and more opportunities for each other. 
never has the law of abundance been more present than right now. So um, I, 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 um, that's where I am with that. I wanted to say too, um, that idea that people are sick of screen burnout um, and piggybacking off of what Michelle said, um, you know, it only is a screen if it feels like one. So we all have been in the Zoom meeting where we get on and we're like, <sighs> and then we've been on the Zoom meeting where it feels good, right? And so it's our responsibilities as creatives to find a way to reach through the screen and make people feel like it isn't there. And that it, and, and so there's so many ways to do that. Um, one of the things when I started my presentation, calling people out, inviting them in to, you know, be there with you, inviting them to speak back to you, asking them questions, highlighting them on the screen, being silly. Okay, remember, we have all the serious stuff going on. We got to be silly. Also, you know, for me, I think the number one way to reach people is entertaining them. And entertaining doesn't have to mean um, just being slapstick. It can also mean connecting with them. It can also mean all these things. So it's something to think about. Like what Michelle said, starting off, how do you want people to feel after they've experienced you via Zoom? And um, how do you want to feel? It's you, how you feel is not secondary because we as artists can also experience that burnout. Hey, I was looking at residencies, uh, artist residencies all over the world. I have a book I'm working on and my friend went out of town. She's 20 minutes away from my house and this is my residency. So we have to find ways to pivot as well, right? I'm writing a book. I did my book outline on post-its and I'm actually using the voice to speak instead of actually typing it. There are all these different ways to innovate what we're doing, but innovation isn't just for our audiences. We have to innovate for our souls as well. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, I'm really, I keep bringing that point up that we have been so used to doing our art making and presenting and delivery the way that we've always done it. That we, you know, we first started off in shock, a little offended, a little upset, a little nervous and vulnerable, but mastery requires understanding. If we understand how vulnerable we are, but if we don't create that courage, that courageousness, those people who need us are going to suffer. Those military guys who, guys and gals who told you we need to feel connection. We don't care if it's on Zoom. It's real. When you saw people on their balconies in Italy singing to each other, the art is what makes us human. And if Zoom feels like you have screen burnout, it's a container, right? The screen and the place is a container. But look at other ways that people are using that container. I mean, I was against TikTok. But then my grandson started playing, doing a TikTok dance with me. And I'm like, oh no, I have to like do that. But it's a way to like get people to think and be silly and be comfortable. And so we just have to get over ourselves. I like to, um, the idea of, you know, Zoom is not necessarily one way of doing it. And like you said, Kim, we've all been in those meetings where it's just a bunch of talking heads, you know but you can interact on Zoom. And one thing that um, Eric did in the last session that we learned about, and we tried it again with you, was polls. You can build in these polls, and they could be silly, they could be something very pivotal that you need to know, but it's a chance all during your session to have people interact, talk back to you, as well as using your chat and comment boxes. So use the tools that are out there, and Zoom is, kind of flexing with it too and becoming more creative all the time. I wanted to point out too in the comments, Sheila, who's my homie from Durham. Um, hey, Sheila, she's been performing in parking lots for audiences in their cars. That's so cool. And Sheila is incredible at what she does with circus arts and just mime work and everything. And then there are a couple of people who are asking about newsletters. I know, go Sheila, that's right. I give you a shout out all the time, Sheila. Um, but there were people who were asking about newsletters and how newsletters function right now in this time and how to reach the past, um, past 
supporters. So I would like to talk about that for a moment. Because one person asked earlier, Elaine asked about what um, platform to use. MailChimp is free for up to 2,000 um, subscribers. So I believe in no cost until you need it to be a cost. So check out MailChimp. There are tons of videos. Um, if you go to my uh, website, artistmakesmoney.com, you'll see um, a training that I give on newsletters as well. But YouTube has lots of stuff. And also someone asked about how to use newsletter to reach out to those past customers. And um, I really think you have to, especially now, I think people have low tolerance for salesiness. So genuine connection is the way to go. I mean, and, and how often I think you should reach out. I don't like using the word should. I think you could reach out to your audience um, every other week, quarterly, once a week if it makes sense, if you have enough things that are going on, and think about how to serve them. But even sharing your favorite recipe, that would give, you know, that's connecting with your audience or sharing how you've, uh, you know, a funny story that's happened. And then you say, by the way, I've just created this new limited edition series, or by the way, I have this free training, or by the way, I have this thing coming up. I'd love to invite you. So the way you reach your audience is, is thinking of them as your homies who occasionally buy your art when it makes sense or they buy your services, but they're people who you want to genuinely connect with. That's what marketing is. Letting people know you're there, that you have something to genuinely connect with them with. Jeff and Michelle, have you had any other um, experiences with newsletters or marketing and getting the word out in this new normal? Not really. I was hoping he would. <laughs> no I, I um, we're, we're right there now. Now, you know, we kind of develop our, our uh, assets first and then figure out, you know, what relevance they will take in the world um, and put context around them. So, you know, that's where I had on my screen earlier about your staff. And I think about, you know, your booking agents, like your United Arts Councils and things like that, that they are a place where if you have your material ready, then they have a, the capacity to get it out, you know, to those who are on the, on the search for quality um, arts kind of teaching in the schools or performance as well, Jeff, I want to talk to you about um, some thoughts that we were talking about this morning around performance, some exciting new ways of thinking about it and the purpose of what it would do in the house. I, I, just real quick, I talked uh, this morning with Sharon and us on the cartwheels how one of my sad things is that we have all these great shows in the schools and the parents never get to see them. <laughs> So there's a silver lining, you know, we, I was talking about having these show and tells where you watch the show together and then you tell each other, you know, what you liked or what you didn't like or what was surprising, you know, but um, in people's homes, it's a way to foster those relationships and communication, take the stress off of the parents a little bit who have been holding just an immense amount with their young kids in their homes, trying to um, facilitate their education when they um, maybe are holding their own job at the same time. But back to the marketing and the PR, um, I had a question. Am I allowed to ask a question? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, and that is, you know, when we go to offer these things, I'm sitting here thinking, so I have this great unit on force and motion. I have a great unit on heat energy. I have a great unit on, you know, states of matter and solid and liquid. You, how do we price or or market that? You know, it's different to a homeschool family where they they want this for their household versus to a county who's holding it for the entire third grade of thousands of kids. And can we talk about that a little bit? I think it would be helpful to say how do we value um, our work. And even though it's the same product, its use is vastly different. 
One of the things I found, I'll just jump in there real fast, Jeff. I saw your hand, I'm sorry. I was on a, a big training with 2,000 art artists and arts entrepreneurs. And one of the ladies on there created this homeschool kit that she quickly got together small little projects and things for parents to do with their, um, with their families. And she sold out, I mean, she sold the kit. I mean, it had enough things for them to do for months. And she sold the kit at like $997 each. So people are thinking, oh, I'm just gonna make it $47. Like Kim was saying, that the market can bear a big range of prices. And if you price for the value, because that parent who all of a sudden was like panicked, now is not panicked and that's priceless for them. You, and I don't, I'm not encouraging gouging people, but we as artists, sometimes we're just used to thinking in a crucible about our, our work. And if, if it's for, I got a call yesterday to do some uh, vocal jazz training for some schools in Maryland for a whole district of schools. And, um, you know, I read this negotiating book that says, don't be the first person to speak money. Let them tell you how much they're willing to pay. And sometimes you're surprised. They'll say, oh, I'll, I'll give you X, which, which you may have never even thought of using that price. That's great, Lenora. I, I'd like to speak on that. Just, um, I think, and this is really quick, and then Jeff, please hop in there. Um, you need to know how much money you need. Artists don't do that. They don't do the, you know how you have the fake budget? This is the budget where you don't like eat out or do anything. You're like, here's my budget. And then there's the real budget, the one you never put together because you're like ashamed of, you know, needing pleasure because we all need that, right? Artists need to be really honest about how much money they need not how much money it's just to pay your rent or your mortgage or whatever, how much money you need to live the life you want to live. That's the first question. That's how I price stuff. How much money do I, do I need to make this year, but also the amount of money that allows me to have the experiences because now I got to be more, you know, I got to think outside of the box because now it's COVID. I can't go on my trip to London I've got to figure out another pleasurable thing to do. Maybe it's a road trip, whatever. So that's the first question. And then from there, like, so how much does your organization need to make, right? And then from there, think about how much you want to work, not how much you should price it because it makes sense because they'll say no. Please get really good at hearing no's. No's are so sexy because they allow you to say, this isn't a, a match for me and there is another match out there. So how much money does your organization need? Not bootstrapping, but how much would a, your organization in a healthy way need? And then ask for divided how many people you want to work with realistically, and then ask for the amount you want and then be okay if there's a negotiation around that. So that's a huge thing that artists do not do. We're like, and I don't wanna speak across the board because many artists do this, right? But, and then talk to your artist buds and see how much they're charging. And then maybe you all talk to each other and say, hey, no, now we're gonna think about moving to this echelon because I've been doing this for this amount of years and it's time for me to give myself a raise. And don't be freaked about money. The more you talk about it, the easier it is. The more no's you get, the quicker you get to your yeses. And this is the time to be very honest, take the time to reflect, to be really honest about what you need. Yeah. Can I, can I say something? No, good. Of course. Yeah, yeah. All right, I just wanted, what we've gotten into here is a discussion one about relationships and two about money and the first thing that that i would say is it's the relationships you build with your clients and partners that get you through the rest of your life i i have the good fortune at this point in my life of having enough um people who want my work that 
I accept very few new clients. I mean, the bulk of my work comes year after year. 84% of my work is recurring. It's not four to 10%, it's 84%. And so there's, in the teaching artist area, there are schools that write me into their budget. And that's what I wanted to say. You need to position yourself so that you are there when they're writing the grants, when they're writing their budget, and they call you and say, what will it cost next year? Because we want to write you into our grants because you are so much a part of our fabric and infrastructure. Okay. That's how, how you get ahead of the system. That? I'm sorry. How do you answer that though? If you're a teaching artist just starting out That's and, right. and you don't have that recurring yet. I was looking at a question, you know, I, the discomfort around charging a fee. First of all, no, it's the same as going to the grocery store store you go and you shop and you look how much peas are and you taste these peas and they're more expensive you know why because they're better um, and you but then you make a choice you know if you really want peas and that's all you care about you buy the peas um, I think for those of you who are just starting out go with the, you know prices are published for our in our artist directories and they can change every two years and yes they do go up and they should go up um, because there's inflation and there's and there's expertise and you're offering a service now you can't go beyond what schools can sustain but then you have other markets as well I think it's smart to diversify I'll be the first to say we don't charge the same thing in different places because it, that would limit um, where we get to work and it would also um, not completely value what we have that is rare in certain places. So, um, but start at your, they're online, go to your arts councils and look, and you can see what every artist charges for their residencies, for their performances. And at least you can begin to shop and start to value your work in relation to what's out there and have a baseline. Cause we hurt each other if we devalue what we do in the world. It's a great, and I have also, I started this, gosh, 25 years ago, way back with Liz Lerman, when I was in a situation where it was like, okay, well, this workshop is, you know, $300, and they said, we don't have $300, could you do it for $100, and um, I learned from another artist there, my whole life, and she said, I I can't devalue the workshop. The workshop's still 300. I will accept 100 and you can give me a letter for a $200 donation that I made to your um, church or your facility. So, but I can't devalue the, the, the cost of this work, but I can offer you this donation of 200 and then accept the 100 cash. So, I mean, as long as we begin to like him say, no, really, what did it cost? What does this cost me to live and, and be a professional and then place a value on that? And then, like Jeff said, have a conversation and with, that was built on transparency and, and trust and uh, professionalism. And um, ultimately, um, Black Box, I will say, we have, the same as many of you, have had repeat um, contracts year after year after year because we do bring a uh, value valuable work to places it's so, so good it's some really great comments there Michelle I'm sorry Jeff you I was just gonna say that for for younger people coming in you're, you're I would I talked about relationships and you have to build the relationships that will get you through your career. And if that's relationships with sponsors, relationships with the folks at the Arts Council, relationships with, um, with Kim and her business model, relationships with each other, uh, because when you are selling yourself, the most important marketing thing you can use is if you can inform your buyer, your client, that you are you and your unique skills are the solution to their wants, needs, or problems. And so you have to know about them. You have to do your research. You have to know that United Arts has upped the amount of money that they're giving schools this year, knowing that it's going to be online and in person. You have to know that the Arts Council of Fayetteville, one of the other um, big 
teaching artist um, conglomerations in our state has fully funded their organization. You have to know that down in South Carolina, the um, ABC sites, artists and basic, basic curriculum sites, ha yet they have been granted all their money. However, the state government hasn't passed their budget yet. So their budget may cut their allocation in September. So as a teaching artist, you have to have your, your mind on your art. You have to do good art. That's first and foremost. Second, you have to do your research. You have to know what you have that people want. That's so good. One of the things that I've been doing is going on my Facebook page and doing live just pop-ups, talking about things that I have coming up, but talking about my green grits bowl menu. I mean, my recipe. So to see what the, see what's the, what the audiences are. Is it just my friends or are there new people? Because everyone's online now, Part of your research, someone talked about a social media in the chat, a question about a social, social media strategy. The strategy is relationships, like Jeff was saying. Go to different places, whether you are on Facebook, or Twitter, Instagram, and create relationships. Find other teaching artists to start talking to, checking out their work. If you, are, um, if you change the things you're looking at, the things you see change. And so one of the ways to create those relationships is to be present and to be findable. I also wanted to say, thank you for that, Lenora. Um, I also wanted to say um, my big recommendation, you know, I did teaching artist work for 16 years um, and I still am teaching artists. So I consider that, but um, if you were to contact 10 people who are in the exact same field as you, there are a lot of times that I would pass off jobs that I was not willing to make, especially if you're starting out, right? This is if you're starting out. Jobs that didn't quite pay me what I needed to, but I was happy to pass it off to another artist. So creating relationships with artists and just saying to them, hey, I'm starting out. I do what you do. If there's a job that doesn't work for you, do you mind recommending me? Because I've gotten, and I'm sure many of us who are in this field have gotten other artists thousands of dollars. Lenora sent me an email and that was a $30,000 contract. Okay. And she, she didn't send it to me. She sent it out to several artists. I happen to be the artist who hopped on it first. Right. So that's another strategy. Another thing that I noticed in the chat was, um, there was, and I'm, I don't know the person's name. I don't know how to say the name, but talking about systemic racism, um, and social professional justice artists of color and how we, um, have to be able to compete, compete is not the word, um, you know, and, and find jobs with other, you know, factors that we have to deal with. And so um, my thought on that is you need to hold North Carolina Arts Council and other arts organizations accountable to helping out specifically people of color and other communities that need that help. Someone else asked about how do we find about the changes in funding? You need to, to reach out to the art organizations and say, you know, it, how do I find out how, uh, you know, when the policies change or you have like an artist like Jeff or someone who's been doing this for a long time and they are in the know and you reach out to them every now and then and say, hey, can you, you got 10 minutes to tell me what I need to know, what's going on? So, um, and I see that someone put South Arts is act actively seeking to support POCs. Um, I'll tell you this, um, think about who's making money right now. Grocery stores, liquor stores, all these places. And don't be afraid to contact the ABC board by statute. I've gotten, I don't even know how much money I've gotten from the ABC board. I put together arts programming that talked about alcohol and substance abuse prevention programs because that was what I came from, social sciences, and, and, and they supported that. You just have to make it make sense, right? And all these organizations um, are going to need to give away some of that money during tax time, and the arts are a very attractive recipient for that money. 
So there's, there's that, right? And, and the other final thing, I saw a couple of things in the chat about people um, talking about, you know, fear around asking for things. If you're doing anything in business, hopefully there's a mindset component to that because the fear for asking for what you need is real for so many of us. And so one of the things that I feel like a coach or a, business, a good business coach does is they address a process. They help you with a process, a way to be able to ask for the things you need, to think about the money you need, to have strategies to do that. So, you know, find a way, you know, hit me up in my email, whatever, find a way to find someone who's going to address the mindset that goes around that because that's mindset, the ability to get your mind and your brain on board with what you're trying to do is going to get you to wherever you need to go faster. I love the support. I love what you were saying, Kim. And, and just to piggyback on some of those things, when I reached out to North Carolina Arts Council and Durham Arts Council and said, hey, at NCCU, we, we started this teaching artist certificate program. Um, how can you help us connect to the rest of the folks in the state or the rest of the folks in the city or the Triangle area? When you ask, you get fed, right? And so it is true that there is a disparity in our state about what artists of color have access or resources to. But there are people there now who are working to close that gap. And North Carolina Arts Council reached out to support us to make sure that we could have some success in getting started. Because as everyone knows, if you have a nonprofit or if you're a small fledgling a new idea, it's hard to get some traction. Um, and so the more that you build relationships, you know, it's, you know, I, I have been in many states where I lived where that issue was the same and big cities or small places. Um, but even if it were uncomfortable or if I looked around and I'm the only person of color in the room, I would still raise my hand or still reach out and say, hey, Jeff, can we have coffee? Can, can we talk sometimes? And so I think that this Teaching Artist Tuesday um, seminar, this webinar is, is starting to create the sense in our state that we're not going to keep letting that be the case, if not on our watch. That was our goal, so that's wonderful. That makes me happy. Mm -hmm. um, we've had some other questions come in on the feed, and one of them goes, I, and this is such a great conversation. I, I want to just let everybody go. Um, we had several questions about safety and how you protect yourself as artists as things develop. And it may not even be that you're going into a school or you're going into any kind of public ve venue, even if they're socially distanced. How do you protect yourself? How do you protect yourself if, it, like in a, Michelle's example, you're working in a company? How are you gonna do your performances and interact with your own people and still maintain safety? So would any of you like to address that? I'll be happy to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. One of the things it, 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 there are, the CDC has recommendations and guidelines for pe for essential workers, and if you read them, you and 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 you also look at the EPA standards or the chemicals that they use. Right. This is all part of the thing we have to bring ourselves up to speed on. You will find that. The, what they re basically what they recommend is wear a mask, stay social distance, wear gloves, right? And if we are in situations where it gets tight, make sure you can wear a face shield as well as a mask. You can, you can um, the, I think it's the EPA list N chemicals. Just look through them and see what do I have to clean everything with? Where, where are the high contact areas? Where, where, what props do I have? What like in my in, in like in my circus arts um, workshop, I realized you cannot clean juggling scarves. So now I have to provide a set of three juggling scarves to every student in every class. They will go into a Ziploc bag handled by the teacher. I will never touch them. 
They will keep them together in their Ziploc bags with the child's name on them. And I have to charge more because of that. And I do, you know, so it, it, all, all the cleaning supplies, all of my sponsors know that my residencies are now going to be more expensive because I'm dealing with all, all the CDC wants. And it goes down to the local level. The health department in different counties allows different things. And you have to find that out before you go into that school mm -hmm. or community center or to paint that mural downtown as a community artist. You have to know the, you know, what to do in Rome. That was another part of the question I have, and we, we've talked about pricing your work um, and folding in any costs that you're incurring. Absolutely, and be honest about it. Because of increased safety equipment. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna be honest with you too. Um, it's both and. Yes, both, there are some where I can pass along the cost and there's moments where it may be this or nothing. And I'm looking at a big picture of what um, what this is for the work. And to, if I can offer um, my dancers a paid day rate, um, and that rate doesn't change really with the amount of work they do. My big cost is mobilizing and getting people there. If they're there, they've had to take the whole day off from something anyway. So I'm going to pay them, you know, their their money for the day. And then it becomes a choice. They'd rather do five shows in one day than, and get that day rate than not have a performance that year. And um, they still get the same money and they love their work enough. And if they're young enough, I'm just kidding, <laughs> which is why we're auditioning for new dancers. But um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's an opportunity for them to be paid, but also to get their craft and get their performance chops you know, elevated and out there. So it's a silver lining for some folks who really want to perform to be able to do three shows instead of one. Now the money may be the same for them or maybe it's slightly more, you know, cause I do pay for more for each show of the day. But once you get past a certain rate, it's, you know, it's up to that whether they can physically sustain it. But what it may mean is we shorten each show. So it's, it's less, but more smaller, shorter shows, but more of them so we can accommodate smaller audiences because we have this big theater space, but they can't fill it. You know, they're not allowed to. So we're working with different presenters of creative ways of um, figuring out how do we safely give room for an audience, but also um, uh, we're in this struggle of, you know, what, what do we give up to keep what we love, but also where's the line where it's not okay, you know, not sustainable. I think I asked that question way early on, Kim. It's the cost of, you know, what does it take to make and sustain your best work in the world? And so that's where we keep, that's the lens that I hold up as we go to. to also, for folks who are not willing to go into the school, that is okay too. There is another way to make that happen. I think the first question to ask yourself, and some of us, um, have different health, you know, challenges where, or family members, or, you know, I think the first question to ask yourself is, I, you know, am I willing to go into a school? Um, and then whether, you know, whatever that answer is, then, um, you know, deciding the method that you will use, um, you know, whether it's Zoom, whether, I mean, Zoom is not the only, online platform, by the way, but whatever method you're going to use to connect with your audiences. And again, I want to stress this because I work with teaching artists all the time to help put together online programs. The schools are one source of, you know, reaching people and making money. Individual, uh, you know, working one-on-one -on -one with them, that's a whole nother way. And so I'm gonna stress diversify, diversify, diversify. Don't put all your money in one stock, although I wish it was Clorox. And don't put all your eggs in the school basket. I lived through the recession of what, 2008? And I realized 
You don't have to put all your eggs in the school basket. <laughs> there are other ways to do that um, to make, you know, to be able to sustain yourself. Well, especially, especially with the um, various models that may come out for how people are going to educate their kids. Um, if you have parents at home uh, trying to find resources to support their instruction, um, we were hearing about neighborhoods and pods that want parents want to come together. You know, how might you find out who those people are and, um, you know, address those needs and market to them as well that you have services to provide. We have one other question and it just went away. Oh, somebody answered it. <laughs> Um, question we had Ann, about um, oh you are, we already talked about liability but we wanted to go back to the poll results oh yeah yeah okay so for wow look at that that's interesting how would you best describe your current state of mind so zero people now are saying I'm waiting this out to go back to normal. Remember when Eric did this just two weeks ago, <clears throat> the results have changed. Um, <clears throat> I know I need to change my practices and approaches, but haven't taken action. That's only 6%. That's good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sharon, can you jump in there? I have a crock in my throat. Sure. <clears> throat> I sure can. Um, yeah, and the third level, I'm actively seeking and learning about new approaches and practices. 45% of you, congratulations, that's awesome. That's that whole flexing with the new normal, finding those new things. And the last one, I have implemented new approaches and technology in my practice, which is about the same number of people, 48%, which is wonderful that you're experimenting and trying and reaching out and doing those new technologies. I'm I, looking. Th I think that this is interesting. Don't I'm encouraged by that, aren't you, Sharon? I really am because it is a shift um, from the first session, which is only a couple weeks ago. Um, mm -hmm. We had a large number of people who were considering these shifts for the first time, um, or kind of head in the sand, didn't want to deal with it yet. So uh, that's a good sign, definitely. Yeah, one of the things that happens when there's massive change like we're seeing now is that our, our uh, field is shifting. So in 2013, I started doing vocal jazz online classes and Kim said to me, what even is that? But I kept seeing a need to do the work online because I would travel to countries where the people I would leave and they would, the, the, the students would like, how can I still work with you? And so now we're seeing that uh, at then it wasn't the paradigm. People were thought being online was weird. They didn't want to do it. I had professors at, 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 at NCCU that were like, there's no way I'm getting online. And here we are. And so be thinking about what's going to happen a year from now. What do you want to be able to say about your business? What do you want to be able to say about the way you do your work and your delivery? What, is, what has already changed in the mindsets of people about the, the necessity of the arts? We have a couple other questions that have come in and they're there. One goes back to um, pricing of your work and it's how are you restructuring or rethinking cancellation clauses and fees? Because that could happen as COVID numbers shift around. Have any of you dealt with that? something we need to look into. <laughs> yes. Most of the places where I was working, they said we will um, kind of put a thumbtack in our contract. You don't have to pay us back uh, the deposit and we'll book you in the future. And probably going forward, we'll have to put some kind of clause or statement in the agreements that we have with people. Mm -hmm. Jeff? Well, in, in standard contracts for both performing and for residencies now, um, attorneys general of many of the states have recommended COVID-19 clauses to their school systems, to their arts councils, to their um, 
and uh, and anyway, and essentially it's a um, a cancellation clause that can happen at any time, and that's unfortunate, but that's that's the new reality. Is I can cancel at any time if I get COVID nineteen and I don't owe you any reparations. Also, if your school goes into lockdown and we have planned a um, a Zoom assembly and they can only do essential what they consider essential things and that doesn't include the assemblies i am just out of luck and so it, it goes the in the contract language it goes both ways and it's unfortunate but it's something everybody's accepting and i have very limited experience with this and i'm about to go meet with um our insurance agent because we're up for renewal every August anyway for our general liability. And um, I have heard that basically insurance aid, um, insurance companies are not, um, they have COVID clauses, i.e. if it has to do with COVID, they're not covering it. Where, whereas they would have if it were something else in my general policy. And I hate that I'm being reported, but I'm reviewing it, so I don't know that and it may you know. um, but unfortunately systemically the arts are not funded as well as in insurance agents and um, some of these other entities that are kind of have um, policies in place that I think we do need to be very careful and aware of so I really appreciate the question and just know what we can control and what we can't and what your risk is and whether or not you're willing to uh, or, or able to uh, take on that risk because it is um, out of our power, I think. Well, it's another example of the flexible nature of what's going on right now that you have to be able to flow with it because it's changing and will probably change significantly in the next months. Um, we have another question um, about Zoom. Has anyone had any questions about privacy of the participants when one Zooms from home or where there might be the other onlookers or run into copyright in issues? I've read that reading over video infringes copyright laws, different than reading in person. There are a lot of conversations about copyright going on now on, on Zoom, uh, Google Meet, whatever you're using. And you really have some kind of a, um, you know, a pinned comment that if you're using music, I don't own the rights to this music. I don't own the rights to this image. If it's in an educational setting, there are certain kinds of things, but those are still being discussed and talked about. The more that you just say, I don't own blah, 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 you're at least covered uh, to some extent. It depends on if you are broadcasting it and selling it, you know, but if it's educational purposes and those conversations are still being had. Um, and for what I've done in terms of Zoom for participants that maybe could bomb the Zoom bomb you is to require registration so that you have an email address sometimes people you can choose what people put in in order to register if you want their address um, and, and state or anything like that but most of the time requiring a registration can help that but not a hundred percent we've seen i don't know what are, what are other people's experiences I agree with you um, that that is an issue and we're all it's all new. So I don't think some of the laws have caught up, but I will say like YouTube, um, they have caught up and um, they kind of have a blanket. It's OK. It's not a copyright infringement. If you use any recorded music, you know, they'll just match it and it pops up there. You don't have to do anything about it. You just acknowledge that you don't have the copyrights to it and it's OK. They don't catch you or anything. That's new for YouTube this year. So I, I think, you know, as people, it, it is about the intention and the use and not, you know, I think the loss will catch up to it, but I think to cover and be safe and to reduce your risk, just acknowledge that you don't have the rights. And I think it's uh, suffice for our purposes, but. I think for anyone who's doing, um, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> 
So I like to always give that disclaimer, that law school thing didn't work out for me. Um, I would say um, that I'm seeing people have general waivers um, when they're doing online, uh, you know, classes. Um, it would maybe be worth it to look and see what's online, come up with something and then talk to an attorney if, you know, you, if that's a real concern. Um, I, you know, think that as you're starting out, you can, you know, maybe sometimes figure out if the idea is going to work and then you, you can go a little deeper into that. But again, um, I know Triangle Artworks does workshops and it, I remember I wanted something on YouTube and I hit up Beth and was like, Hey, can you do something on YouTube? And she did. So, um, if you have a question, maybe hit up, um, triangle artworks. I know one of you wonderful folks are going to put the link in the chat because the chat is popping. Y'all have been helping each other out. I love it. So, um, drop triangle artworks in and then, um, hit up the ED, um, and ask for something about, what you know how a workshop on how to do things online um the correct way because there are lawyers on their board and other folks well and that might be a topic for a future teaching artist tuesday so Great. if that is your desire please make sure you put that in your um post event survey so that we know that's something you're interested in and i hate to say it but we are out of time mm -hmm. oh been such a dynamic conversation you guys have been just amazing we so appreciate you jumping in and sharing your knowledge and your experiences and i think the group will agree this has been a wonderful afternoon yes i agree too it's been amazing to hear and see what artists are doing in real time i think the the evidence of the chat conversation and the people we've had almost half of as many people on Facebook Live as we've had in our Zoom. Um, so thank you for your time and your expertise and your big open hearts. And please join us for the next session, which will be in two weeks. And that link will probably go live, I'm assuming in the next day or two. So stay tuned. It'll be on our webpage and our Facebook page. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening.